the groups and individuals who make up the lobby pursue two broad straight geese to encourage steadfast U.S. support for Israel. First, they exert significant influence on the policy-making process in Washington. Second, these organizations go to considerable lengths to ensure that public discourse about Israel is favorable and that it echoes the strategic and moral rationales discussed in chapters 2 and 3. We examine the first of these strategies in this chapter and explore the lobby's efforts to shape public discourse in chapter 6. Because political power in the United States is divided between the legislative and executive branches, the lobby's tactics sometimes vary depending on which branch of government is involved. In addition to helping get sympathetic individuals elected or appointed to key positions, groups in the lobby strive to shape the political calculations of officials who might be tempted to chart a more independent course. Whatever legislators or Paul I.C. Maker's personal views might be, the lobby wants uncritical support for Israel to be the smart political choice. Like other powerful interest groups, in short, the Israel lobby achieves its aims by constraining the policies key officials are willing to consider, pressing them to take steps they would rather avoid, but will pretend to favor, making it hard for U.S. leaders to sustain initiatives that groups in the lobby oppose, and shaping perceptions and framing options, so that many key leaders willingly favor the policies that these groups endorse. Holding sway on Capitol Hill a key pillar of the lobby's effectiveness is its influence in the U.S. Congress. Unlike virtually every other country, Israelis largely immune from criticism on Capitol Hill. This situation is remarkable by itself, because Congress frequently deals with contentious issues and competing viewpoints are usually easy to find. Whether the issue is abortion, arms control, affirmative action, gay rights, the environment, trade policy, health care, immigration, or welfare, there is almost always a lively debate on Capitol Hill. But where Israel is concerned, potential critics fall silent and there is hardly any debate at all. The absence of serious deliberation when Israel is involved was revealed in a hearing on the Israeli-Palestinian peace process held on the 14th of February 2007 by the Subcommittee on the Middle East and South Asia in the House of Representatives. With Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice trying to restart the moribund peace process, the subcommittee sought testimony from three witnesses. Despite some differences on certain policy issues, all three are central players in the lobby, Martin Indyk, the former APAC Offi, Sayle and former U.S. Ambassador to Israel who now heads the Sabin Center for Middle East Policy at the Brookings Institution, David Makovsky of the pro-Israel Washington Institute for Near East Policy, and the near-conservative pundit Daniel Pipes, who directs the right-wing Middle East Forum. No critic of Israel, much less a Palestinian or Arab-American, was brought in to offer alternative views or suggest the United States take a different approach. M.J. Rosenberg, who once worked for AIPAC and is now a key figure with the Israel Policy Forum, a moderate pro-Israel group that actively supports a two-state solution, nicely summed up the situation. This was a hearing about two sides of a conflict where only one side was allowed to speak, adding that everyone who saw an official congressional hearing that banned the Arab point of view was either hurt by the spectacle or injured by it, and that damages the interests of America and of Israel, to one reason for the lobby's success in Congress, is that some key members have been Christian Zionists, such as former House Speaker Richard Army, who said in September 2002 that my no priority in foreign Paul IC is to protect Israel, one would think that the top priority for any US representative would be to protect America, but that is not what Army said. Regarding Tom DeLay, Army's successor as Speaker, Morton Klein, the president of ZOA, said that he cared about Israel in every fiber of his being, Delay himself said that he was an Israeli at heart. There are also Jewish senators and representatives who work to make U.S. foreign policy support Israel's interests. In 2006, in fact, a record number of Jewish Americans were elected to the House and Senate, a fact that underscores their impressive achievements in American society and their traditionally high level of civic engagement and political participation. Some of these legislators, such as Senators Joseph Lieberman, DCT, and Charles Schumer, and Representatives Gerald Nadler, DNY, Henry Waxman, DCA, and Robert Wexler, DFL, are ardent defenders of Israel Deg indeed. Waxman said in the wake of the 2006 election that there will be some Democratic chairman who may not share all my views on Israel. He made it clear, however, that there will not be chairing committees deal. I'm with Israel and the Middle East. He was right, of course. The chair of the House subcommittee that held the hearing described above was Gary Ackerman, DNY another avid backer of Israel, while the chair of the larger Committee on Foreign Affairs is Tom Lantos, DCA, who has no rival on Capitol Hill in his devotion to Israel. As one former APAC leader put it, Lantos is true blue and white, 
but it isn't only the representatives themselves who can tilt legislation in a pro-Israel direction. Congressional staffers are at the center of the legislative process, registering the positions of outside interest groups and parsing different policy options for their bosses. As Morris Amate, a former head of APAC, once noted, there are a lot of guys at the working level up here, on Capitol Hill, who happen to be Jewish, who are willing to look at certain issues in terms of their Jewishness. These are all guys who are in a position to make the decision in these areas for those senators. You can get an awful lot done just at the staff level, as discussed below, representatives from groups in the lobby sometimes participate directly in this process, helping Hill staffers draft legislation, providing them with talking points that legislators can use in public, helping write the dear colleague letters that legislators send one another to position themselves on key issues and drafting and circulating open letters designed to put congressional pressure on the executive branch. Of all the groups that make up the lobby, it is APAC that holds the key to influence in Congress, a fact that is widely acknowledged by politicians from both parties Bill Clinton once described APAC as stunningly effect, tithe and better than anyone else lobbying in this town, while former House Speaker Newt Gingrich called it the most effective general interest group across the entire planet, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid, DNV, agrees, saying, I can't think of a policy organization in the country as well organized and respected as APAC. The New Yorker's Jeffrey Gold calls it a leviathan among lobbies, and IPAC's own website proudly quotes the New York Times' assessment that it is the most important organization affecting America's relationship with Israel. IPAC's success is due in large part to its ability to reward legislators and congressional candidates who support its agenda and to punish those who do not, based mainly on its capacity to influence campaign contributions. Money is critical to U.S. elections, which have become increasingly expensive to win, and APAC makes sure that its friends get financial support so long as they do not stray from APAC's line. This process works in several ways. To begin with, many of the same individuals who bankroll APAC are often important political contributors in their own right. Using data from the Federal Election Commission, FEC, the journalist Michael Massing found that between 1997 and 2001, the 46 members of IPAC's board of directors gave well in excess of $3 million in campaign contributions, and many of them remain generous donors to pro-Israel PACs and candidates today. Since 2000, the Washington Post reported in 2004, APAC board members have contributed an average of $72,000 each to campaigns and political committees. Second, APAC helps connect political candidates to other donors and sources of funds. Despite its name, APAC is not a political action committee and does not officially endorse candidates or give money directly to their campaigns. Instead, APAC screens potential candidates and arranges meetings with potential donors and fundraisers, and provides information to the growing number of pro-Israel PACs. According to the historian David Biel, the American Jewish Israel lobby has developed since the Six-Day War into one of the most sophisticated and effective lobbying organizations in the United States Congress. It has done so in part by developing a national network of Jewish political action committees for contributing funds to congressional candidates based on the criterion of support for Israel. As APAC President Howard Friedman told the organization's members in August 2006, APAC meets with every candidate running for Congress. These candidates receive in-depth briefings to help them completely understand the complexities of Israel's predicament and that of the Middle East as a whole. We even ask each candidate to author a position paper on their views of the U.S. Israel relationships so it's clear where they stand on the subject. Friedman's description of IPAC's modus operandi is consistent with testimony from other political figures. Tom Hayden, the anti-war figure who was running for a seat in the California Assembly in the early 1980s, explains how he was support from the local power broker Michael Berman, brother of longtime California Congressman Howard Berman, on the condition that he would always be a good friend to Israel. Hayden, who won the election, notes that he had to be certified kosher. Not once but over and over again. The certifiers were the elites, beginning with rabbis and heads of the multiple mainstream Jewish organizations. An important vetting role was held as well by APAC, a group closely associated with official parties in Israel. When necessary, Israeli ambassadors, councils general and other officials would intervene with statements declaring someone a friend of Israel Hayden, one may note, merely held state-level offices in his political career. Although he was unusually visible in that role, in the same vein, Harry Lonsdale, the Democratic candidate who ran unsuccessfully against Senator Mark Hatfield, R.O., in 1990, has described his own visit to APAC headquarters during that campaign. The word that I was pro-Israel got around, he writes. 
I found myself invited to APAC in Washington, D.C., fairly early in the campaign, for discussions. It was an experience we'll never forget. It wasn't enough that I was pro-Israel. I was given a list of vital topics and quizzed, read grilled, for my specific opinion on each. Actually, I was told what my opinion must be, and exactly what words I was to use to express those opinions in public. Shortly after that encounter at APAC, I was sent a list of American supporters of Israel, that I was free to call for campaign contributions. I called, they gave, from Florida to Alaska. Former Idaho Governor John V. Evans tells a similar story about his 1986 campaign against incumbent Idaho Senator Stephen Sims. He visited APAC headquarters, where, according to Evans, they emphasized constantly that they were not a PAC, political action committee, but they noted that there were Jewish organizations all over the country that had their own PACs and that if we could contact them, they would be able to help us. According to the Wall Street Journal, APAC steered Mr. Evans to a say, rise of supposedly independent organizations many of them run by people with ties to APAC that gave him $204,950 for his losing race against Re. Republican Senator Steve Sims. APAC also keeps track of congressional voting records and makes these records available to its members so that they can decide which candidates or PACs to support. Candidates or incumbents who are seen as hostile to Israel, on the other hand, can expect APAC to guide campaign contributions toward their opponents. Internal APAC documents acquired by the Washington Post in 1988 revealed that its deputy political director was A.C. Tively trying to help raise money for several candidates in the 1986 Senate. Ace and the Wall Street Journal reported in 1987 that despite IPAC's claims of non-involvement in political spending, no fewer than 51 pro-Israel PACs most of which draw money from Jewish donors and operate under obscure sounding names are operated by APAC officials or people who hold seats on IPACs to major policyholders' bodies. Although the Federal Election Commission later ruled that there was insufficient evidence to conclude that APAC controlled the network of pro-Israel PACs, the belief that APAC helped guide contributions remains widespread, dead the vet. Aaron diplomat David Newsom, who served as Assistant Secretary of State in the Nixon administration and as Undersecretary of State under Jimmy Carter, reports that when a prominent member of Congress was once asked the reason for the power of APAC in the legislature, he replied, money. It's as simple as that. The Center for Responsive Politics, CRP, a nonpartisan research group that tracks campaign contributions, has identified roughly three dozen pro-Israel PACs active in recent elections. In the 2006 midterms, these groups gave more than $3 million to candidates from both parties. Between 1990 and 2004, reports The Economist, pro-Israel groups contributed nearly $57 million to candidates and parties, while Arab, American and Muslim PACs contributed slightly less than $800,000.77. When combined with individual contributions to particular candidates and donations given to the national party or organizations themselves, pro-Israel forces wield considerable electoral clout. According to CRP Stephen Weiss, if you are a candidate and you get the pro-Israel label from APAC, the money will start coming in from contributors all over the country. There is little doubt about the potency of these tactics. In 2006, for example, Money from pro-Israel groups and individuals helped Senator Joseph Lieberman retain his seat by running independently following his defeat by Ned Lamont in the Democratic primary. Lieberman received a total of more than $145,000 from two dozen different pro-Israel PACs, and none of these groups helped Lamont. In the same year, $76,000 worth of pro-Israel PAC contributions helped Sheldon Whitehouse defeat incumbent Senator Lincoln Chaffee, RRI who had long been regarded as lukewarm on Israel, 25 other beneficiaries of pro-Israel PAC support include successful candidates such as Robert Menendez DNJ and Brad Ellsworth DN. According to Ron Campis of the Jewish Telegraph Agency, the money for these and other candidates was raised by a loose network of donors, many of whom have strong ties to APAC, the pro-Israel lobbed APAC and its related network cannot influence every election, of course and even large donations from pro-Israel groups could not get Lonsdale or Evans elected or prevent former Senate Minority Leader Tom Dashley, DSD, or incumbent Senator Rick Santorum, oh, PA, from being defeated in their respective bids for re-election in 2004 and 2006. Two, but over the past three decades it has helped many successful candidates win their races, while driving from office a number of individuals it considered unfriendly to Israel. In 2002, for example, it helped defeat Congresswoman Cynthia McKinney, DGA, 
by funneling campaign money to her opponents. McKinney returned to office in 2004 but was again defeated for re-election in 2006. Hank Johnson, her victorious opponent in the 2006 Democratic primary, received at least $34,000 from seven pro-Israel PACs another well-known case, wealthy Chicago businessman and four. Mayor APAC President Robert Asher helped recruit and vet an Illinois attorney, Richard Durbin, to run against incumbent Congressman Paul Findlay, RIL, in 1982. Durbin had never held elected office, and as Asher later recalled, I probed, Durbin's, views, wanted to make sure we were supporting someone who was not only against Paul Findlay, but also a friend of Israel. He beat Findlay with a lot of help from Jews, in state and out of state. Now, how did the Jewish money find him? I traveled around the Kuntri talking about how we had the opportunity to defeat someone unfriendly to Israel. And the gates opened. Asher solicited funds with a letter to potential donors declaring that the election was the best chance to remove a dangerous enemy of Israel from Congress. And Durbin eventually received a total of $104,325 in campaign funds from 30. One different pro-Israel PACs. By way of comparison, in the 1982 election, other Illinois Congress Sinal candidates received an average of about $3,700 from the same groups. Ig Durbin went on to narrowly beat Findlay, who had served 11 previous terms, and he later won election to the Senate, where he currently serves as Majority Whip. In 2002, Mayor Bubba Mitchell, another member of the Gang of Four, the group of wealthy donors that guides IPAC's policy making, used similar tactics to oust Congressman Al Hilliard, DL. Like Durbin, Hilliard's opponent got financial help from APAC supporters across the country. According to The New Yorker's Jeffrey Goldberg, Asher later said that he had asked Bubba how he felt after Hilliard's opponent won. And he said just like you did when Durbin got elected, APAC has also played an important role in defeating a number of other politicians who took Posey Cheyennes it disagreed with, including Representative Pete McCluskey, ICA, and Senators J. William Fulbright, DAR, and Roger Jepson, RIA, to name you. Jepson's fate is particularly revealing. He was targeted after he succumbed to a personal plea from President Ronald Reagan and agreed to support the 1981 sale of a wax aircraft to Saudi Arabia. His opponent in the 1984 Senate race, Democrat Tom Harkin, received more than $100,000 in pro-Israel PAC money and Jepson lost his seat. Senator Alan Cranston, DCA, later commented that Jepson's fate has sort of struck terror into the hearts of senators about switching on Middle East votes. Another example of the lobby's ability to influence elections concerns former Senator Adlai Stevenson, DIL, who ran for governor of Illinois in 1982. He first ran afoul of pro-Israel groups in 1980, when he introduced an amendment to a Senate bill that called for reducing foreign aid to Israel if it did not stop building settlements. Stevenson knew the amendment would never pass, but he wanted to show that his colleagues would support Israel even if it was acting in ways that were contrary to official US policy. The measure was easily defeated gaining only seven votes. One reluctant opponent of the amendment, Senator Quinton Burdick, DND, told the Illinois senator, sorry, Adlai, but I'm up for re-election when Stevenson ran for governor two years later. He quickly discovered that campaign contributions began to dry up, and indeed, went to his opponent. According to the former senator, he and his wife were reviled as anti-Semitic. Some in the press turned hostile. Jewish Democratic commitment wilted under pressure. Jewish friends and supporters were also reviled, Stevenson was narrowly defeated, and as he later said, the lobby made the difference in that election many times over, perhaps the most renowned example of the costs that can be for a politi. Ken who crosses APAC is the defeat of Senator Charles Percy, RIL, in 1984. Despite a generally pro-Israel voting record, Percy incurred IPAC's wrath by declining to sign the APAC-sponsored letter of 76 protesting President Ford's threatened reassessment of U.S. Middle East policy in 1975. He also made the mistake of calling PLO leader Yasser Arafat more moderate than some other Palestinian terrorists. Percy's opponents in both the primary and general election in 1984 received large sums from pro-Israel PACs and a businessman from another state California, Michael Goland, who was also a major contributor to APAC spent $1.1 million on anti Percy advertising in Illinois, Goland was later convicted of making illegal campaign contributions in the 1986 California Senate race, Tom Dine boasted after Percy's narrow defeat, all the Jews in America, from coast to coast, gathered to oust Percy, and the American politicians those who hold public positions now, and those who spy got the message, Dine's high, in purple notwithstanding, 
The basic lesson of these cases is hard to miss, is J.J. Goldberg, the editor of The Forward, said in 2002, there is this image in Congress that you don't cross these people or they take you down, APAC and pro-Israel PACs focus on more than getting Israel-friendly candidates elected, they have also had notable success turning politicians who have been critical of Israel into steadfast supporters. Former Senator Jesse Helms, RNC, was an outspoken critic of the US foreign aid program for much of his career, which also meant that he opposed giving substantial aid to Israel. In 1984, however, Helms was in a hard-fought, and expensive, race for re-election against James Hunt, the popular governor of North Carolina. Sensing an opportunity to put a formidable enemy out of business, APAC channeled large amounts of campaign money to Hunt, who came within a hair of winning. Helms got the message. He traveled to Israel the following year and had his picture taken with a yarmulke on his head kissing the western wall. The same trip also produced a picture of the senator with Ariel Sharon for his office wall. More important, Helms became a vocal supporter of Israel and remained one until his retirement in 2002. One sees a similar evolution on the part of Senator Hillary Clinton, whose support for Palestinian statehood in 1998 and public embrace of Sua Arafat, wife of Yasser Arafat, in 1999 provoked strong criticism from groups in the lobby. Clinton became an ardent defender of Israel once she began running for office herself, and she now gets strong backing including financial support from pro-Israel organizations and individuals. After Klein Tun appeared at a pro-Israel rally in July 2006 and expressed strong support for Israel's highly destructive war against Lebanon, Helen Friedman, executive director of the hardline Americans for a Safe Israel, declared, I thought her remarks were very good, especially in light of her history, and we can't forget her kiss to sue her pro-Israel PACs contributed more than $30,000 to Clinton's 2006 re-election campaign. And the forward reported in January 2007 that Clinton was expected to snare the lion's share of the Jewish community substantial political donations in the race for the 2008 Democratic presidential nomination. If electoral pressure and persuasion don't work, APAC has been known to threaten politicians who appear reluctant to follow its lead. Deg in 2006. For example, Congresswoman Betty McCollum DMN, a liberal with a solid pro-Israel voting, record, nonetheless opposed the APAC-backed Palestinian Anti-Terrorism Act. The measure, which sought to impose draconian measures on the Palestinian Authority in the aftermath of the election of Hamas, was also opposed by the State Department, the Catholic bishops, and other pro-Israel groups like Americans for Peace Now and the Israel Paul IC Forum. Nonetheless, an APAC lobbyist told McCollum's chief of staff that the representative support for terrorists will not be tolerated, a threat that led McCollum to demand an apology from APAC chief Howard Kaur and to bar APAC representatives from her offices. The basic message is clear. Any senator or representative who crosses APAC is playing with fire. Although the lobby's efforts are hardly the only reason that these defeated candidates faced electoral challenges and even Thule lost. For example, Cynthia McKinney's prospects were also damaged by a much publicized confrontation with a Capitol Hill security guard, and Lincoln Chaffee faced an uphill battle given anti-Republican sentiment in 2006. Its ability to affect a politician's electoral prospects is well known. As one congressional source put it in 1991, voting against Israel has become like voting against lumber in Washington state. Except APAC does it all over the country. And that is why Morris Amate, the former APAC director, who later served as the organization's treasurer, could say in 2002 that everyone seems to be very good nowadays. And why Jimmy Carter said in February 2007 that I don't see any present prospect that any member of the US Congress, the House or Senate, would say, let's take a balanced post shine between Israel and the Palestinians and negotiate a peace agreement. He added, it's almost politically suicidal. For a member of the Congress who wants to seek re-election to take any stand that might be interpreted as anti-policy of the conservative Israeli government. IPAC's clout also explains why attendance at its annual policy conferences has become a command performance for prominent members of both parties as well as leading officials from the executive branch. Speakers at the 2007 policy conference included Vice President Dick Cheney, Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi, DCA, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid and Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, RKY, and House Minority Leader John Boner, RO. The previous year's speakers included Cheney, Boner, UN Ambassador John Bolton, Senators Susan Collins, RME, and Evan Bay, DN, and Representatives Roy Blunt, RMO, Shelley Berkey, DNV, Otto Davis, DL, Bill Pasquale, DN, 
J. and Robert Wexler, as well as former Senator and Presidential hopeful John Edwards. Speakers in other years have included President George W. Bush, Secretaries of State Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice, former House Speakers Dennis Hastert, R.I.L., Richard Aramey, and Newt Gingrich, and a bevy of prominent pro-Israel pundits. It is hard to think of any other lobbying organization that is wooed strenuously by politicians in both parties.